The artist's role in society is to shine a mirror on our strengths and to expose our weaknesses. Through a remarkable body of work, today's guest does just that, as a poet, as a visual artist, as a scholar and author, and even as a comic book writer. She's Eve Ewing, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he does every week is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square studies big issues with great guests, journalists, authors, scholars, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week, we're joined by one of our favorites. Eve Ewing is a sociologist at the University of Chicago, a poet, a visual artist, an author, and we should know, a comic book author. Eve, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's just a joy to be here with you all again. Thanks for having me. There's so much that we want to talk to you about, but I want to start with sort of the thrust of a lot of your scholarship that is particularly relevant today, uh, white supremacy, and what we need to do as a society to, to, to move beyond it. If you were to sketch out sort of a top five things, top three to five things that we need to do, where would you start? Oh, that's, uh, we're just going to dive in with the right easy Right in, we're questions. just going right in. <laughs> you know, I think um, one of the first things is, is acknowledgement. And I think that that is a process that is, that is happening um, right now in many corners of the country, but still has a lot further to go. Um, I think that something that's been really alarming for a lot of people in the last few months is to realize how little they actually know about American history in some areas, um, how little they know about contemporary policy, Lots of things that when people actually start to, to dive in and inquire about are, are really shocking. Um, I say about myself all the time as somebody who has studied race and racism for years, and I get to do that as a living, I get to read about this stuff all the time. I'm constantly confronted with things that are, that are new to me that are shocking and horrifying, both about our history and about the present moment. And I think that that step of acknowledgement is really important um, because without it, we really can't go anywhere. But it's also not enough, right? So I, I also think um, another thing we need to think about is what reparations looks like in this country. And to understand that uh, racism and white supremacy are not just about bad feelings or individuals discriminating against one another or personal biases, but is actually about the unequal and unfair distribution of, of resources. And by resources, I don't just mean material wealth, but I mean things like access to housing, access to healthcare, access to a quality education, that those things are all distributed across the, the kind of public landscape according to the patterns and the logic of white supremacy. And so we need to have really difficult conversations about what, what that looks like. Um, I feel like those two steps are, are pretty intense. <laughs> Uh, if I had to, if I had to think about a third one, I think, um, I think thinking about what constant vigilance looks like, because um, inequality and and cruelty across the history of the country and the world has had a really uncanny ability to morph into lots of different uh, phases. It looks a lot of different ways, and so um, I think that you know, if we were ever to get to a point where we were to say, oh, you know, we've we've fixed this thing, we've solved racism, we've ended white supremacy. That would mean that we would also have to think about what vigilance looks like on into the future to make sure that the human impulse towards kind of dominance and control and cruelty doesn't just uh, change into something else, right? And and history tells us that that it can take many different, very pernicious forms. So I think that those are those are three big steps. And for me, those are not things that I expect to see accomplished in my lifetime. Those are not. That's not like a, a policy checklist for a presidential candidate or something. That's a that's a set of ongoing processes because we have to understand that these systems took centuries to construct, and so they may very well take centuries to undo. But we can't ever get there if we don't start. You know, you so, start. You started with something really powerful: the, the idea of acknowledgement. And and I'm curious your thoughts about a lot of your scholarship, a lot of your work as a sociologist focuses on uh, uh, on, on schools in particular. 
And I'm wondering when we think about sort of the role of public uh, of public schools in particular as sort of telling those stories that move one generation to the next and, and tell the stories of the nation. Have schools failed in that regard to really sensitize Americans to our history? Certainly, schools have failed magnificently <laughs> in that regard. Um, but that's not an indictment on schools because schools are, you know, part of the reason that I'm so obsessed with schools, as you said, it's something, you know, I, I write about a lot and think about a lot. I began my my professional career as a middle school element, as a middle school teacher, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teacher. Um, and I always kind of joke that there's something wrong with me. Like I never really left middle school. I'm just sort of obsessed with it. But the reason I'm obsessed with schools is partially because of their sort of institutional peculiarities, but also because they they hold up a mirror to the society in which we live. And so the history of American public schooling has always been the history of our country working out its anxieties, its issues. Um, and it's kind of neuroses of, of the era in this public sphere. And as other public arenas in our lives have uh, been so eroded, uh, something that we're becoming hyper aware of during the pandemic as we realize how poor our social safety net really is, how um, this kind of ongoing agenda of, of delegitimizing public institutions has left us in, in this place, um, that for me magnifies the importance of public schools. So all of that is to say that, uh, yes, it's true that our schools, by and large, are not doing a great job of teaching children about um, certain aspects of American history and actually, moreover, have been a very powerful kind of counterintelligence or propaganda arm in children learning things that actively uphold white supremacy. Um, but that being said, that's that's an indictment of our society overall. And I also think that at the same time, schools are one of the most exciting spaces where there's an insurgency of of not only educators, but also young people themselves, and also education that's happening outside of formal schooling spaces um, and, and you know, kind of peer-led and community-led education. Uh, and there are lots of really incredible teachers and librarians and administrators and community leaders all over the country that are trying to make schools a space of kind of radical possibility right now. So let me back up here for, for a second, and then we're get going to get into uh, your book, which is obviously about schools or one of your books. We are now more than halfway through 2020. The processes that you discussed that have to happen are underway in, in, at different stages in different parts of the country with different people and whatnot. Do you think, though, that more than halfway through 2020, we are at a point in history where those processes are happening with more vigor, with more enthusiasm, reaching more people? In other words, have we made a step forward here at all? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm very hesitant at all times about narratives of progress um, and kind of linear, you know, we we talked a little bit before last time I was on the show about uh, my kind of uh, orientation as an Afrofuturist. So as an Afrofuturist, I, I don't think about, I try to avoid thinking about time as linear as much as possible um, because I think it kind of narrows the way, uh, you know, narrows our imagination a little bit. So I'm always wary when people are like, aren't things better though? And uh, because I think that the danger is that some people think that forward motion or forward momentum is just kind of natural and that it's it's like Newton's law, right? And like, once we get going, we're just gonna have this inertia, this momentum moving us forward. Um, and that's not true. We have to constantly be working and working at this. Given all that, I will say, yes, I think that we are, uh, I would describe it as maybe kind of like an inflection point moment. If you think about, you know, a graph or a sine wave or, you know, whatever your preferred visual metaphor is, I think that we are at a moment where there's a potential to kind of flip a switch and, and push ourselves in a different direction. And I think that that's a very powerful moment. I think that that moment is a testimony to the hard work across many, many generations and the sacrifices and losses of people who came before us who were fighting just as hard and maybe were not in the same kind of moment where there was a zeitgeist around them to support them, people who labored and died in obscurity. And I think that it's uh, incumbent in terms of our, our relationship to them and our, our duty and our obligations to them that we keep this moment going. And also that we acknowledge that, yes, as this is a very, very powerful moment in terms of people's awareness, people's action, people's kind of will and commitment to changing the face of the country, it's also a truly terrifying time in terms of the rise of what I would characterize as, as authoritarianism, you know, verging on fascism. And so as powerful as the collective voices right now to say we want to see radical, you know, social change, 
there's also a lot of power working in the other direction. And that power has shown itself to be unapologetically violent. That power has shown itself to be uh, willing to use any resources at its disposal to, to kind of crush opposition. So um, it's not, it's not going to be an easy fight. So much of that power obviously stems from politics and the political beliefs of people uh, regionally and nationally, certainly in Congress and in the White House. How do, you, how do all of those forces come together? And, and regarding your fear of fascism, which is you know, shared by a lot of people, by the way, how can that be countered? You know, you said you didn't want to have it like a presidential, you know, candidates list of, of all the issues that need to be discussed. But at some point, there has to be that political change. So I've asked a lot of questions there. Maybe you could just give us an assessment of where we are politically and where we should go and how we could go in, in the right direction. Sure. Well, I think, you know, um, a metaphor that I've learned from some of my political mentors and that I that I think is a common one of these different variations of it is that, you know, voting is like brushing your teeth, right? It's the it's kind of the bare minimum. You wake up and you do it. And I think that we can fall into a trap of seeing voting as kind of the, the be all end all of political action, which is really demoralizing and demobilizing when we also talk about uh, when we talk honestly about the many ways in which people are being systematically de denied access to the vote right now. And so uh, I do think that, you know, I, I vote, um, but I'm also I encourage other people to vote, but it's not something that I'm as dogmatic about as other as some other folks are, because I think that that's um, it can't be the alpha and omega of our political action. Um, and I think that what's what's really, really important, you know, part of the, the purpose of this show is is about stories. It's about framing narratives, right? It's about informing the conversations that people have about things. And as I've been just reading and writing, uh, I have a, an article that's coming out at the end of this month um, in Vanity Fair that I won't say what the topic is because I want it to be a surprise. But I will say that I was reading a lot about fascism for this article. And one of the things that becomes really clear from historical precedent is how important the construction of what philosopher Hannah Arendt refers to as unreality is in the maintenance of authoritarian regimes. And we see this kind of unreality so casually constructed all the time, multiple times a day by the president, right? So the president goes outside and he has no problem saying the sky is purple. And you can show him infinite pictures and people can ask him about the blue sky and people can, you know, show him documentation about the blue sky and he will insist that it is purple until the cows come home. And that has an effect of um, chipping away at our own sense of what we understand to be true little by little. And those kinds of things, you know, he does this every day and it seems sometimes um, really not important or it seems about like it's about petty things or silly things. But these things have a cumulative effect in that they they wear they wear us down. And if you've ever been in an abusive relationship, or if you've ever um, known somebody who who is abusive, this is this is a tactic people use, right? Is that they they actually wear you down because you can't argue over every single thing when this person is insisting to you constantly that your reality, the reality that you perceive in front of you, is not real and is not happening. And so I think that that's something we constantly have to do: is that no matter how tiring it gets. We can't become complacent in just accepting uh, lies that we see to be demonstrably untrue on a day to day basis, particularly as it pertains to things that are matters of life and death, like the global pandemic that is decimating our country and that is disproportionately harming the people who are already the most socially vulnerable. Right. And so and, and that has become a site of incredible and consistent unreality. Right. Being told things that we know are not true. And so I think that 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 is a that's a front in this war. It's a really important front in this war that I that I want to uplift alongside things like like voting, which are also important, as well as um, constantly speaking out for against attempts to disenfranchise people from voting, as we're seeing right now with uh, the debacle with the Postal Service, as we've seen for many years in terms of how incarcerated people are treated. Um, as we've seen in terms of voter suppression efforts, you know, outward unapologetic voter suppression efforts, especially in black communities and so on and so forth. You know, Eve, so you use two words here that I've heard others use uh, privately, uh, authoritarianism and fascism uh, to describe the risk that the, that the country faces right now. But I don't hear a lot of uh, folks uh, on mainstream 
uh, news outlets talking about the, these risks. And uh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I guess, I'm not surprised that you, you're 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 sort of a courageous voice in everything Thank that you. you do, and so I'm not shocked that you've said it. Um, but I'm wondering your thoughts, if you've given any thought to um, the 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 relative paucity of that language in the public discussion right now. And even the the uptick in the in the role of individuals who are willing to echo the sky's purple narrative, you know. So I'm I'm thinking specifically about hydroxychloroquine, right? Uh, which science has said again and again, nope, it's not helping. It doesn't help. But I can go onto my own social media feeds and see people that I went to high school or college with swearing about the value of hydroxychloroquine and echoing what the president has said. So I guess two questions there about the the source of your courage, but also sort of the, the role for the rest of us in, in, in confronting those lies. Well, thank you, first of all, for saying that. You know, I think that when I, when I speak about those things, I, I think a lot of that is informed by my position as, as a black woman, uh, where I just don't have time to waste. <laughs> you know, I just don't have time. I just, I just, I don't got the time. I, you know, I, I, I really think about, um, I think a lot about people like, like Ida B. Wells, um, and I think a lot about people like Ella Baker and the, the cost of standing up and saying things that um, are alarming to people. And, you know, I, I write a lot. I've written a lot for, for many different outlets. And I usually don't get um, I, I'm very private about my contact information. So I actually don't get a lot of like hate mail and things like that as much as I used to. Um, I get a lot of Internet harassment, but not as much on my email because I'm very protective about that. But. One of the pieces that I got the most pushback from of anything I ever wrote is um, a few years ago, I want to say 2017 or 2018, I wrote this op-ed in the New York Times, uh, and it was about the defunding of the NEA and of the National Endowment for the Arts. And I was, I was arguing that, you know, Trump trying to defund the National Endowment for the Arts isn't just about, like, he hates ballet or he's not cultured. It is a step towards authoritarianism. And the history of fascism and authoritarian regimes in other countries shows us that these types of leaders, they see and understand the, the power of art in uplifting the voices that make it clear that their lies are lies. So they understand that art is really dangerous. And if you look at what the NEA funds, it's, it's like really often very small potatoes. It's $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 all across the country, every, all 50 states to, you know, the, the disabled youth choir in this place or the LGBTQ theater group in this place or you know, the, the Muslim person who's hosting a one man show in this place. And all those things are really dangerous and really difficult to control. And when I wrote that people, you know, they wrote me these emails, they're just like, you've gone too far, right? Like once you start saying this, this F word, you're, you're being alarmist. And, you know, I would just rather be wrong. I would rather be the person who is, is, is shouting fire and, and go into the lobby and find out that somebody dropped a smoke bomb than sit there while the thing burns down. I mean, what, what it's just ridiculous to me. And I think, you know, another person whose name I want to uplift in that conversation is, is uh, the queer black woman poet, Audre Lorde. And she wrote, your silence will not protect you, right? Your silence will not protect you. And I think, Jim, that that's what, um, that's what a lot of people think. They think that the, the risk of speaking up and saying, um, you know, this looks dangerous or this doesn't feel right or this doesn't smell right or Let's go back a couple years and remember the fact that, you know, we still have immigrant children and families being detained under inhumane uh, conditions. We still have a person who said he's going to ban Muslim people from entering the country. Like all these things are not ancient history, guys. This stuff just happened in the last couple of years. And it's very easy to be to be moved to the next crisis because all of these things are, are crisis. They're genuine crises that in any other circumstance would define an entire presidency, would define an entire generation, but they just pummel us one after another. And so it, it really lowers people's um, kind of tolerance and their, their resistance to these things. And I think that it's because they think that it's safer to be silent or that silence is going to somehow save you. And history tells us that that is just not the case. And I think the thing that makes me really sad about this moment, you know, if we look again, if we look at history, we, if we think about the passing of somebody like John Lewis, um, it, it was so when John Lewis passed, a thing happened that everybody, you know, we all knew was going to happen, which is the very same people who, in some cases in his lifetime, were intransigent against the things that he was fighting for. And in other cases, they're like the 21st century Bull Connors, right? They're, they're the 21st century George Wallace's, the people that are upholding the very systems that John Lewis 
risked his life met time and time again to fight against, that they were the same people eulogizing this kind of over sanitized version of the civil rights movement. And we know that after the fact, everybody loves the movement. Everybody wants to wear it on a t-shirt or have it as a poster in their dorm room. But when it's happening, it's actually not so fun. And people think it's really dangerous and scary. So none of that is a surprise to me, the fact that people are, are kind of afraid. But the only thing that makes me really sad about it is that um, after the Holocaust, after the civil rights movement, after the internment and incarceration of Japanese American people, after all of these atrocities, um, people who suffered have stood up and, and tried to educate us. And after their trauma, have nevertheless worked through that trauma and spent a lot of time and, and livelihoods trying to prevent us from making the same mistakes and falling prey to the same atrocities. And it really hurts me um, to know that their work has been so disregarded. And I don't want to say it's in vain because it's not, but it's, it's really painful to see people who have survived these kinds of, you know, atrocities against humanity standing up generation after generation and saying, you know, we can never let this happen again. And then just seeing the same patterns repeat. It's, it's really, um, it's really disheartening. It's really disheartening. But the only thing that, you know, as the, there's always people on both sides, right? So for everybody who is silent there, are, you know, I don't think I'm that exceptional. I think that there are lots of people that are speaking up. And the question is, how do we elevate and support one another in that effort? So talk a little bit about your book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and School Closings on Chicago's South Side. Uh, it's a seminal work. Uh, Thank you. For, for those who may have may not have read it, give us sort of a summary and, and, and why you wrote it. I mean, obviously, it's a great work. Thank you. You know, it's been, um, I'm very grateful to see people, some people returning to the book um, during this moment and some people picking it up for the first time. Um, so the, the book uh, came out in 2018, seems like a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. and it's about uh, the closure of 50 public schools in Chicago, which is the largest mass public school closure in the history of the United States. Um, and the schools that were closed, um, I, I can say disproportionately, but it's more accurate to say almost exclusively um, impacted black families, black children, black teachers across the city of Chicago. And so when that happened, um, people in, in our communities were saying, well, this is, this is racist, right? You're closing our schools because of racism. And school leaders said, it's not, it has nothing to do with racism. The buildings are just really empty. These buildings are under-enrolled. There's been demographic changes. There's been population shifts. And so, you know, to save money, we have to just close these buildings. It has nothing to do with race. And so the book is um, my attempt to look at an event that happened in 2013 and to take it back really about a century earlier and to say, actually, this is entirely racist and has everything to do with the history of, of white supremacy and, and segregation and more fundamentally, a, a, just a, a basic disregard for black children and, and black life um, and, and black legacies. Um, and uh, kind of I, I make that historical case. And then I also talk about the impact of school closures on, on marginalized communities. Um, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that it's a book that I got a chance to write. And I think that um, one thing that I was trying to do is, you know, the book is about Chicago and Chicago history. But what I've been trying to do in, in the writing and also in touring once upon a time when I could leave my house, uh, <laughs> touring and, and talking to people all around the country about, about the book is to think of it actually as a blueprint for how all of us can investigate these kinds of questions in our own communities, because I contend that in every community, there's some kind of fundamental inequality that sits on an edifice of something much deeper and much more painful and some history that people either don't know about or don't want to talk about. So really what I'm trying to do with the book is, is to uh, create a prototype or a kind of model for what it looks like to say, OK, this thing that we see happening in the present almost always has much deeper roots. And it's really worth it to take the time to try to figure out what those are. Eve, you know, so um, we've only got a couple minutes left here, and this is a question that could probably take us an entire episode, but the, the current iteration of the Black Lives Matters movement since the death of George Floyd uh, has reached a scale that uh, I don't think it, it had before uh, in terms of its national impact and the number of people that were in the streets this summer and late this spring. Uh, I'm curious your sense of what that movement uh, might actually accomplish uh, and and where we are in, in sort of progress or trying to make progress on, on these issues. 
Well, I think the movement has accomplished a lot already. And I think that, you know, one of the critiques of, of Black Lives Matter movement has, or we could call it the movement for Black Lives, or there's many ways of kind of describing it, um, is that, you know, people have said, like, what are the demands and where are the leaders and what have they actually done? And I think that if, if what we're talking about is like, for example, a legislative agenda or those kinds of, again, check, check boxes, that it becomes harder to pinpoint those things. But I think that the movement has been incredibly effective in forever, irreversibly changing the conversation about, about racial justice in this country. And I think that it's what's really powerful right now is to see, as you said, a, a new wave of people moving into the streets, many of whom were not necessarily in the streets when Ferguson was happening or when Baltimore was happening or when Laquan McDonald was killed in Chicago. Um, and also, I think it's really important for people to recognize um, the many ways that movement building happens that is not only about street protests, right? That street protest is one kind of formulation or one manifestation, but people are doing so much incredible work right now in terms of building mutual aid efforts, um, changing, educating one and one another about what it means to abolish police, to abolish prisons. And I think that that work is, is really a sign of, of the incredible impact of, of the movement. I'll, you know, to give one very specific example. But, I mean, in 10 seconds. Oh, okay, 10 seconds. I think that the mutual aid that we've seen across the, the pandemic is really uh, something that has also arisen from, from the Black Lives Matter movement and that people learned in one context and brought to this new area of need. Well, Eve, it's a great body of work. The book is Ghosts in the Schoolyard. We didn't even get to talk about Ironheart, and I'm really disappointed about that. Next time, next, next time. Next time. Uh, and you're welcome Eve here Ewing. anytime. She's Eve Ewing. That's all the time we have this week, but we hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.